This house is in session. Minutes of the meeting held on Tuesday, 19th April 2022, and Tuesday, 26th April 2022, to be confirmed. Honorable Leader of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move that the aforesaid minutes be confirmed. Questions that the aforesaid minutes be confirmed. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting the eyes have it. The aforementioned minutes are hereby confirmed. Announcements by your honor, the speaker. Messages from Her Excellency the President, petitions, papers. I remember St. James Central. Mr. Speaker, sir, I am commanded to lay the Fair Trade Commission annual report for the year 2020. Government notices. Private members, notices, notices of questions, reports from select committees. First readings of bills. Honorable Leader of Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the first reading of the Safety and Health at Work Amendment Bill 2022. Questions that the aforementioned bill be read here first time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting the ayes have it. Statements by ministers. Congratulatory and or obituary speeches, personal explanations, motions for leave of absence, oral replies to questions, notices of motions for the adjournment of the House on matters of urgent public importance, orders of the day. Honorable Leader of Business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the suspension of standing orders 6, 16, 18, 20, 42, subsection 5, 43, and 44 for the remainder of the day's sitting. Questions that the aforementioned standing orders be suspended for the remainder of the day's sitting. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. The aforementioned standing orders are hereby suspended for the remainder of the day's sitting. Government business, sir. Government business is the order of the day. Order number four. In the name of the Honorable Minister of Energy and Business Development, to move the second reading of the Airport Service Charge Bill 2022. Honorable Member St. James Central. Mr. Speaker, sir, um, this should not be a particularly difficult exercise. Um, I rise to move the Airport Service Charge uh, Bill 2022. And Mr. Speaker, sir, as I do so, perhaps I should reflect on the aim of the legislation which is currently attracting the attention of the House. It is the imposition and collection of airport service charges in a nutshell. And you may well ask, sir, well, if I travel last week or last month, did I not pay airport service charge? And the answer to that would be yes, you did. And so therefore, the next question logically, logically would be, well, what then is this about? And the fact of the matter is, sir, that um, we are form formally uh, returning to the completion of a process that began in 2018. And just so that I give it the appropriate context, sir, you may recall the honor about the start of August 2018. Um, in my capacity then as Minister of Tourism and International Transport, I would have come to this honorable chamber, sir, for the House to consider an act to amend the airport service charge um, cap 59 of the laws of Barbados. And the purpose then, sir, was to increase the airport service charge. And the rationale for that was twofold. First, Mr. Speaker, we felt it was necessary to broaden the base of contribution um, to the, the maintenance of services and the maintenance of infrastructure at the Grant Lee Adams International Airport. Um, and that, sir, it perhaps is worthy of a little bit of elaboration because 
I think all of us accept that, and certainly back then, in 2018, we were very, very clear in our judgment that we had to get this country to the point where it is today, where Barbadians can see themselves in a slightly different light and feel a certain sense of pride that we are, in fact, capable of delivering world-class services, that we are, in fact, capable of doing so, Mr. Speaker, sir, within the context of building out world-class infrastructure at, at world-class standard, and to be able, sir, to uh, boast, as we like to do, about the capacity that this country has to be top of class. It is ironic that I have to say that this week, sir, because it was only last week that I spoke in a similar debate in this place and had to reflect on that desirability um, for us as a country. An example of what we had to do, Mr. Speaker, perhaps helps tell the tale because it is all well and good to talk about delivery of world-class services and have world-class infrastructure, but obviously these things come at a cost, and very often, sir, at a significant cost. Um, it would have been in October of 2018 that the Caribbean Development Bank approved a loan of 40.4 million United States dollars, Mr. Speaker, sir, <clears throat> for us to do some fundamentals. Things like the rehabilitation and expansion of the runway at the airport. The rehabilitation of the car park facilities at the airport. Basic infrastructure maintenance services at the airport. And, and sir, why do I reflect on that? Because, sir, an airport runway that was designed to have a life of 15 years Mr. Speaker, sir, when we came to office was in its 18th year of existence without that rehabilitative work being done. Now, the average person out there, <clears throat> even those people who are devoted almost to the point of borderline zealotry in their support of the Democratic Labour Party, fanaticism, sir, even to the point of fanaticism. The ones, for example, who are sitting down right now waiting to get on to voice the Barbados just to find something to criticize the government about. All of them, bar none, I suspect, would agree that the airport, air transport rather, is a vital aspect of this country's um, economic arteries because it ensures connectivity with the rest of the world. All bar none, Mr. Speaker, I suspect would agree that air transport is vital because of its support for the tourism sector. That air transport, Mr. Speaker, sir, um, above and beyond being a major pillar of the tourism sector, is a major pillar, Mr. Speaker, sir, of the economy more widely because it is a supplement to most of the sectors on which the livelihood of Barbadians depend. But yet, Mr. Speaker, sir, that runway which is the only runway that the country has, was allowed to degenerate to a stage where it had passed its useful life and was literally crumbling. So that, sir, you could sit in the aircraft and as you go down the runway, you are seeing cracks becoming potholes. And, 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 and sir, it was as though the last administration felt that this was not a critical component of the ability of this country to achieve the level of competitiveness that it needed to achieve, it was as though you could just allow this situation to go on indefinitely. And needless to say, pilots do not owe any special debt of obligation to Barbados. The International um, Air Transport Association does not owe any special debt of obligation to Barbados. International Civil Aviation Organization does not owe any special debt of obligation to Barbados. And all of those entities, sir, seeing what they saw, expressed, and understandably so, their concern about the state of disrepair and seeming lack of interest on the part of the then administration. 
So, Mr. Speaker, sir, as I said, we then went to the, came to this house in 2018, and we um, would have brought that piece of legislation to which I just referred. And the 40 point, the four million United States dollars, which was dedicated towards um, the uh, rehabilitation of the runway, sir, by the Caribbean Development Bank, um, was put, and uh, let me say that, that that work to which it was dedicated has now been completed, um, so that the, the, the runway at Grand Yadison Airport is a spanking new state-of-the-art um, strip and the correcting of the aging and weakening airside pavement has been, has been done. Um, we have built out additional capacity, especially for corporate, Mr. Speaker, sir, and general aviation aircraft. Um, and equally important has been the foresight of recognizing that high energy costs on a high intensity runway were being incurred because the edge lights, sir, and the apron lights um, were all traditional type bulbs and not the LED type fixtures, which serve to help op uh, reduce operational costs. And all of those types of adjustments and amendments were made. And the costs associated with those improvements, Mr. Speaker, sir, inevitably have to be repaid because it is a loan. And they carry, these things are carried on the backs of the Barbadian taxpayer. And we felt then, sir, as we feel now, that the base of contributions, sir, had to be broadened in order to allow for all persons who are utilizing the services of the Grand Adams International Airport to be contributing. Now, there was a period of time in this country where that school of thought was anathema. Uh, it was apostasy. It was like it was like flying in the face of the Almighty. Because, Mr. Speaker, sir, there was a feeling that it, well, first of all, it begins with a lack of confidence in this country, that we do not see ourselves as being capable of delivering global class, first in class services to the point where our tourism product will not be compromised simply because we ask people to pay the value for what they get. Ours has been a school of thought where we feel that forever there must be a subsidy given even to an industry that has reached global standards and is competing with the best in class in the world. And so, Mr. Speaker, sir, we brought from that orthodoxy and, as the Prime Minister likes to say, adopted a posture where many hands would make light work and uh, um, we eased the burden which fell as it always tends to fall and has always fallen in the history of this country on the backs of the working class people of Barbados, sir. And we ensured that there would be a broader base for the services provided at Grantley Adams International Airport. Carriage of cost by Barbadians is a point which I should probably reflect on because it is important to understand, <coughs> sir, that back in 2018, we were confronted with a government debt that was $16.9 billion. Um, dollars. Uh, I, I should say, sir, that we worked that down to $12.7 billion by the time that airport had to stop receiving international commercial traffic at the start of the pandemic. Um, in 2018, sir, the government of Barbados, when we came to office, we were confronted with a set of circumstances where the trade payables, the money that you owe to Barbadian contractors and to Barbadian service providers and other vendors doing business with the government. <laughs> and everybody wants to do business with the government, Mr. Speaker. But the government owed out $2 billion to the Barbadian community. And because the zealots in George Street will never tell you this, sir, I must ask that you allow me to say it, that in 2022, January, we had paid that down to 63 million Barbados dollars, down from the 2 million in 2018 where we found it. No, sir, that is the, the benefit to be derived from broadening the base of participation so that you can allow for sources 
of, of income, a wider stream or a wider net catchment area for your revenue. And Mr. Speaker, sir, that is really what the rationale was about with respect to the airport service charge adjustments back in 2018. The second basis on which we operated, sir, was again to abandon ill-considered orthodoxy and to move this country to a position where it could pay, where it could pay the, the cost of marketing Barbados in a manner that did not fall once again solely on the backs of the Barbadian taxpayer. Because in the end of the day, sir, key to the tourism product is being able to market this country in every capital where we are seeking to do business, in every destination which we are reaching into. Whether those destinations, sir, be in traditional European and, and North American claim, or whether, sir, it is in Latin America and Africa and other parts of the world. Well, Mr. Speaker, sir, the cost of that traditionally fell to the taxpayer. There was a time when it was $100 million that the taxpayer had to look for every single year in order to keep the Tourism um, Authority, the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc., afloat $100 million. More judicious measures were then subsequently applied, um, economies applied, and Mr. Speaker, sir, it worked its way down to about 70 to $80 million on average every year. The fact of the matter is, sir, that through the imposition of this service charge, the, the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. draws from the, the pool. And therefore, we were in the happy position in March of the year 2022 when COVID hit, where the government, the, the Parliament of Barbados, in the estimates of this country, dedicated only $7 million towards the op operation of the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc., down from $70 million a few short months ago. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, that is the, the tale, that is the proof of the pudding, the proof of the success of the policy that in what year were we elected? In 2018, what month? What, what, what month? Was it May? May 2018? thereabouts. May 2018, sir, we were looking at a state of, of, of affairs where it would have been $70 million that the taxpayers of Barbados would have had to look for for the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporated budget. And by the time you got to 2022, Ms. Tw sorry, 2020, Mr. Speaker, sir, when COVID hit that year, the Parliament of Barbados only had to look for $7 million, one-tenth of that which it had previously had to look for prior to a Barbados Labour Party administration led by the Honourable Prime Minister. And Mr. Speaker, sir, that is the second rationale for us having to treat to the question of airport service charges in the way we did. Needless to say, there were several naysayers. There were several persons who said it could not be done, but it, it has been the characterization of this administration, sir that we have had to do the previously unthinkable, and we have had to execute with competence in the teeth of opposition um, to everything virtually that we have tried to achieve. And even when we have done so and done so successfully, there are those who find it difficult to part their lips. It is as though their tongues are cleaved to the roofs of their mouths. They cannot find it possible to say, job well done, thou good and faithful servant. But that is life. Well, Mr. Speaker, sir, <clears throat> in 2018, August, when the airport service charge was amended, um, the amendment, as I said, sir, was a response to the need for us to find new revenue measures. But it was also an urgent response because of the state of high indebtedness that I just alluded to. Um, one of the concerns that were raised, and I remember distinctly having to leave Barbados almost at a moment's notice, to go up to Texas to meet with the International Air Transport Authority, Mr. Speaker, sir, because they required gazetted information in order to implement the air, airport service charge at the point of sale. Um, they felt then that this was something that um, they heard the government, they did not want to intervene or be seen to be intervened, because IATA, IATA, is really almost like a trade union for the airlines, a global trade union. 
and they did not want to be perceived as intervening in the domestic politics of Barbados, but they did feel, Mr. Speaker, sir, that we needed to make sure that we um, had a gazetted piece of legislation where they could say to the rest of the world, this is where the government of Barbados is going. We don't personally agree, and they did not, but that this is what government of Barbados wants to do, and we will not stand in their way. And so therefore, sir, the gazetting of that piece of legislation was done on the 16th of August, 2018. <clears throat> now beyond the speed of the implementation, it was envisioned that a more thorough review of the legislation would be conducted at a later date. Um, and as I will portray to you, sir, the reason why we had to have a more thorough, thorough portrayal of the legislation was simply because of the fact that ex sections of the existing act would become either unworkable or would become irrelevant um, as a result, sir, of the new steps that had been taken at that time when this legislation was passed. Now, sir, um, what are some of the challenges or some of the changes that this legislation will bring? Payments, sir, received by the collector will no longer be paid into the consolidated fund. Um, they will not be retained by Grantley Adams International Airport. They are distributed in accordance with the instructions of the Ministry of Finance. That was the, the um, position of the adjustments to the legislation made back in August of 2018. It has continued from back in 2018 until today that it, the funds collected as airport service charge do not go into the consolidated fund. They are not held by the airport for its own purposes, but they are distributed in accordance, sir, with the instructions of the Ministry of Finance so that entities, for example, the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporation, are able, sir, to fuel its existence and fuel its marketing budget um, without it being uh, a burden directly on the, the taxpayer. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, the bill has a number of clauses, and I'm going to pay a little bit of attention to the important ones as we go through. The Clause 3, sir, speaks to the eligibility to tax. And that Clause 3 <clears throat> it says that there shall be imposed on a person who travels from the airport to a place outside of Barbados a charge to be known as the airport service charge. All, all applicable, all passengers, sir, are, are um, how would, let me put it better. All people traveling out of Barbados are liable to be to be um, are liable to payment of the airport service charge. There are, however, one or two exemptions. It is important at this point, perhaps, to draw the comparison between that which traditionally took place under the old legislation. The old legislation is found at Cap 59 of the Laws of Barbados, because what we are trying to do, sir, is to broaden the net to make sure that as many people as possible who are traveling out of Barbados to another country are liable to pay the airport service charge, as it should be. But sir, when this process unfolded many, many years ago, this is what the legislation provided. I now turn to the old legislation that we are going to repeal today. Cap 59, as it is now, sir, um, says that the airport service charge shall not be payable by the governor general, his wife, or children under the age of 18 years. Well, I suspect, sir, that that would now have to be, if it were to be continued, would read the president um, and spouse. At that time, sir, it was not conceived that there would be a female governor general or that that female governor general, sir, would have a spouse. Um, the members of the House of Assembly or the Senate, Mr. Speaker, not to pay any airport service charge. The wives, the husbands, or children under age 18 of the members of the House of Assembly or the Senate, the guests of the government. Oh, Mr. Speaker, so this is what the legislation used, this is what the legislation said, this is how it was treated. This administration, that they say, sir, so many horrible things about, this administration, is not one where we bestow on ourselves privilege, not one where we bestow on ourselves special benefits, Mr. Speaker, sir. 
We are not an administration that perpetuates a view of there being Medes who are distinguished from the Persians, Mr. Speaker. This administration is doing what other administrations in history of Barbados did not choose to do, which is to remove the benefit to members of parliament, remove the benefit to the senator, remove the benefits, Mr. Speaker, sir, of positions of privilege and say that everybody got to pay the service charge to, to use the international airport. That was the position that we adopted. And I break it down in this way, sir, so that those who are, as I say, fanatical in almost borderline zealotry in their, in their not supportive, because they ain't supporting anything really. It is that they are doing this in an anxiety to, to pull down a government, sir. That they understand that this government has distinguished itself by going in a direction that ensures equality of treatment in this country. The, the range of exemptions continues. Persons traveling on government business exempted. Um, official representatives of the government of any country and their wives or children under the age of 18 when traveling with them, exempted. Staff members of international organizations who in accordance with the terms of the agreement of their respective organizations and the government of Barbados are entitled to exemption from payment of any charges or taxes on travel undertaken in the performance of their duties. Further exemption applies to members of the police force, members of the Barbados Defense Force, applies sir, to children under the age of 12, applies to in-transit passengers remaining in Barbados for a period not exceeding one day, exemption applies to members of the crew of an aircraft, any aircraft, exemption applies to persons traveling in any aircraft, the weight of which is less than 6,000 pounds gross, or such other persons or classes as the minister by order may specify. So that was not a closed category, sir. It was like negligence. The categories of negligence are never closed. And this open-ended category, Mr. Speaker, sir, was the way in which the airport's administration was being managed. No longer the case. Not only did we abandon the privileges and the entitlements and the special benefits, sir, and we abandoned it because of a very clear philosophical position, let me say, let me take time to say that, because it is not the intention of any member of the cabinet of this country that somebody goes on a stage at Cropover and sings that a man in a Benz and I in a taxi, that he living a big life and popping style pun me. That is not the intention of any member of this government, Mr. Speaker, sir. And so again, we treat to try to distinguish ourselves in the best way possible. The exemptions, are now truncated, and they are one, two, three, four in nature, all fundamental. Staff members of international organizations who in accordance with the terms of the agreement of their representative organizations and the Barbados government are entitled to be exempt from the payment of any charges or taxes on travel taken in the performance of their duties, they are exempted. Children under the age of two for the very good reason, sir, that they're sitting in, in mommy's lap or in daddy's lap for most of the time and not really utilizing any, any services at the airport. In transit passengers remaining in Barbados for a period not exceeding one day, that is a globally understood um, position with respect to taxation um, on service charges. And members of the crew of an aircraft, because again, that is in keeping with the expected standards um, as laid out by the IATA, who, as I said, are the global trade union or equivalent of the global trade union of uh, international air carriers and who expect a certain level of courtesy to be extended to their, um, to their constituents. That is now the limit of the exemptions, Mr. Speaker. No more and no less. And gone, hopefully, forever is that arbitrary discretion where a minister could decide that, oh, I can extend it to this body, and I can extend it to the third body, and I can extend it to my cousin best friend, and so on and so forth. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, Clause 4 outlines the fact that a carrier which transports a person by whom the airport service charge is payable shall collect the charge and pay over to the collector, and that that collector is Grant Lee Adams International Airport. Remember, it is not for the, the airport to hold on to. 
it is for them now to treat to that money collected in the manner prescribed by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, there was a time, I hope you remember the bad old days, where when you went to the airport, you went at the desk as you check in, and you take out your $25, as it used to be then, and you pay the airport service charge. You guess I have a little stamp on it, Mr. Speaker. And <laughs> that, that process, that process, sir, was the way in which airport service charges were, were treated to. Now, it was fraught with some difficulty, and I will come to that difficulty very shortly. But I want to say that under this new arrangement, the service charge has two limbs. The first, sir, is that if you are traveling to a regional destination, you can pay $70. And if you are traveling to a non-regional destination, you're paying $140. No, sir, that has been the case since 2018, so there should be no hue and cry in this country because that was part of the adjustment that I came. I came to this parliament and dealt with that in August of 2018, and it has remained that way ever since and, and continues. You will recall, however, that there were those who felt that it was a death knell on the tourism sector. And I know more tourists ain't coming to Barbados because you're going to ask uh, a foreigner coming here, somebody from America, to pay 70 US dollars? Oh my God, how could that happen? It was unconscionable. But you know, Mr. Speaker, so that prior to COVID, the arrivals from um, the United Kingdom reached record levels. Arrivals from United States of America reached record levels. Arrivals, Mr. Speaker, sir, by way of cruise, um, stay over, reach record levels. All that happened between 2018 and the dawn of COVID. So that those who were prophets of gloom and doom, who were the naysayers, sir, uh, and, and nothing could be successfully achieved, they were proven, sir, to be quite inaccurate in their thinking. Um, and in fact, it went even further because we also broadened the base and told people that you got to pay a little bit more for the use of the hotels as well the people who are staying long, long term. And I remember how badly I was cursed when that happened. I ain't dead, but I know the hotels did well too, because when we brought records, when the night took place here that Virgin Atlantic could not, could not take off because there was some mechanical difficulty and they had to bring in another plane and you had more people who were at the airport, yeah, about 500 people at the airport, who could find no bed. It was like the biblical story, sir, of he who is the master. There was no bed, no room in any inn. And some of them, sir, had to be uh, given temporary accommodation um, in, in, in circumstances there in Bay Street where the Virgin Atlantic supported location existed. And they opened it up and brought out, brought out the lounge chairs and so on. And many English tourists spent a night under the moon um, on the beaches in Barbados. And I am told it was an experience that they have never uh, said they will never forget. Uh, you know, no, Mr. Speaker, sir, that, that, that's, that's the reality. What happened? Because we did not have the hotel rooms in Barbados to accommodate. Uh, the, the people, set of people come in that evening and the ones who were supposed to leave could not leave. And you had to find special accommodation for them. But this is the commitment that we must have to continue to make sure the growth. It must be a philosophy that says we can do this and that we can grow, commit ourselves to a growth trajectory and do everything within our power, each and every one of us, every day as we go to work in order to make sure that we contribute in some way in some measurable, meaningful way to expanding the potential that this country has to earn. And that, sir, is a position of, from which I will never shy away. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, the regional destinations, they paid $70, and they are uh, the CARICOM. What is the regional destination, you may ask? They are the 14 countries of CARICOM who would have been established pursuant to Article 2 of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramas, um, 2001. And then you add to them Cuba, you add the Dominican Republic, the Isles of the British, the islands of the British Antilles, the islands, Mr. Speaker, sir, of the Dutch Antilles, the islands of the French Antilles, the U.S. Virgin Islands, 
and of course, last but not least, the, co least, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. So they are the regional destinations that, will only, or that are only paying $70. Everybody else, 140 Barbados, or 70 US. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, the question for those who are more discerning will be, where, the, where a carrier fails to collect the charge, what happens? The carrier shall, according to Clause 4, notwithstanding the failure, pay to the collector an amount equal to the charge. So if there has been an administrative oversight, let us assume that it was just an oversight, then it is still a debt due and owing, and you have to pay the amount equal to that which was not paid, even though you didn't collect it. And it is the duty of the carrier to keep appropriate records and to furnish such returns as may be necessary, sir, in order to, to, to make sure that the um, transparency as expected under this act is, is maintained and that those sums which are due and owing to the government of Barbados are paid over within one month. Failure to do so is treated to at clause nine of the bill, and if you do not pay over, you are liable to a fine of $20,000. So for a $140 omission, if you want to play powerful, then you're going to look at paying over $20,000. A sufficient disincentive, I would imagine. Under the existing Act Cap 59 of the Laws of Barbados, a carrier who failed or neglected to make a return in accordance with the requirements of the Act, sir, or in any such return makes a false representation. Let me put that in language that the non-lawyers will easily understand. Under the current legislation, if you fail to pay over the $25 as it used to be, the departure tax, or you had it and say something about its existence that was false, the penalty for that was $240. No wonder it is that there were so many occasions which I came across as a little teenager working in a part-time job up at the airport, which I came across again as a university student trying to make a little few ends meet so that I could carry out a girlfriend or two when the weekend come by working up at the airport. I did those things, Mr. Speaker, sir. Um, and I see one or two other hands being raised in the house, who, which suggests to me that um, they either understood the importance of making a dollar to carry out a girlfriend or that they work at the airport too. Um, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, sir, that back then, you would constantly find these little issues arising, these humbugs that $240, um, that, that $25, $50 not accounted for, uh, people going away, and the penalty, sir, for the maladministration was only $240, and very often, sad to say, it was not human error, but human bad behavior that caused the money to go missing. So that human element has now been taken out of the, of the mix. There's no longer the temptation for a sticky finger to cause a piece of change to disappear. The carrier, American Airlines, British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, them so will carry the responsibility for making sure that the passenger head count is equivalent to the amount of money that should be collected and therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, if there is a discrepancy, then they are the ones that we go after for the $20,000, which is the fine for every discrepancy that has been identified. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, um, as I said previously, under Cap 59, claims to the exemption entitlements were also disputed. And as many entitlements as the exemption as you had there, in this act, there were those who felt that even they didn't fall within, even though they didn't fall within that wide net, that they should get an exemption too. Sometimes it was as simple as the fact that the children are 12 and under, is 12 and under, they're getting the exemption. But I still want my 40 year old child to get one. And I got fight up because you know who I am, and you know how there's this bad tendency, often perpetrated by 
people who I have seen their vehicle park in George Street. <laughs> park in Belleville, George Street. You know who I am? I am so and so, so and so. I want an exemption. Well, you have to be frank. I've never come across a situation, sir, where some of these folks that I see about Barbados wearing red and yellow um, shirts behave that way. It may happen, but it is not known to me. But I have seen, I have witnessed myself one or two individuals who are known to frequent that neck of the woods behave in that unconscionable manner. And Mr. Speaker, sir, any person who fails to furnish the immigration officer under that old act with any information that the information the immigration officer might want to have to establish that you are in fact entitled to the exemption for the departure tax. Because what's happening there or what was happening is that there were people who were prepared to keep noise. Let's speak it in the language of the people on the street. That you will go to the airport back then knowing full well that you are not entitled to get an exemption from departure tax, knowing full well you're only being asked to pay $25, that you're going away to America, that will cost you far more to get on the plane than $25. You're spending a couple of weeks up there, so I must imagine you're going to live, you're going to eat, you're going to drink, and probably shop where you're there too. So you have money. But the government of Barbados was not to get that money. You keep in noise over $25 because you must get an exemption from departure tax because you are whoever. And Mr. Speaker, sir, then they called, the law required an immigration officer to get the necessary information there and then on the spot. And there were some people who would not cooperate with the immigration officer so as to enable him to make the necessary um, decisions as to whether or not you are entitled to the exemption. And the legislation then created another nonsense fine of $50. Criminalizing people, sir, if you're not able to provide the information to the, inf the immigration officer, you pay $50 and you get a criminal conviction. And Mr. Speaker, sir, the system then became clogged. The airport is not a place that should become a court. The airport was not a place sir, that immigration officers had to be trying to decide who is and who is not entitled to this exemption. And, 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 and by extension, the police at the airport, who should be there for security purposes, should not have them to be carrying men off to the nearest magistrate's court so that they could get a forfeit fine of $50 because of the fact that they made a false claim. So all of that has been taken out of the legislation, sir. We have done away with it. As I said, the carriers now assume responsibility uh, for the money due and owed, and they have a month to make good. And under the old act, sir, the, the service charge, which remained due and unpaid, sir, as I said, <laughs> that in itself became an issue. <clears throat> because you probably may not have had cause to look at this legislation in recent times, Mr. Speaker. But I'm, no, I'm sure it will amuse you as a practitioner of law. To know that this legislation required a customs officer, no less, to abandon his post of customs officer in order to intervene and manage a situation where the $25 in departure tax was not paid. And he then had to put arrangements in place if the money was not paid over immediately, arrangements will have to be put to his satisfaction to make sure that that $25 could be recouped at some later date. Now, during that period of time, according to this legislation, the customs officer was empowered to hold the departure of the aircraft, sir. Until that resolution of the $25 matter, don't hold your head and shake it, Mr. Speaker. That was the absurdity. That was the absurdity that, 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 that existed in the system. And it is part of the reason I go into detail here, not because I have to, because I can wrap this up quickly, but I want people within earshot and the students who will come and read Hansard 5, 10, 15, and 20 years from now, to understand how this government has had to take systems that were decrepit 
decayed, virtually unworkable, Mr. Speaker, sir. Because even as you sat there, the look of consternation on your face told the story. And it was the same thing that I confronted when I was minister and I saw this for the first time. That you will hold an aircraft that got 200 people on board in the first class compartment and some in economy are in a hurry to get back to New York because they got a job in Wall Street, which is paying them 15 and 20,000 US dollars a month. But they are here to do business in Barbados. But you're going to hold them for an indefinite period of time because they got one or two people who are quarreling about whether or not they should be exempted from paying $25. What is the message that we were sending to the rest of the world? Is that the best practice? Is that the best in class that Barbados needed to be? But, 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 what, what, how do you do business in an environment like that? You can hold up a whole aircraft. And when the aircraft does reach where it got to go late, then it incurs fees because of the fact that you arrive late, you have a certain apron parking position assigned to you for a certain period of time. You get there late, Skipper, you got to pay a little money for that because the boy holding that for you. If the thing is commercial, commercially unworkable, it was midsummer's madness. But that is how we operated. And we have had to dissect, break down the thing, break, the, break it apart. What was the Prime Minister? Deconstruct and reconstruct. Mr. Speaker, to get past the absurdity of a delay of an aircraft over a debt due for $25. So, Mr. Speaker, so that, in a nutshell, is what this, this piece of legislation is about. As I said, it's a very simple thing. Um, we had, <clears throat> having passed the, the, the act in 2018, we recognized that there were some parts of it, because of the amendments made, that became unworkable. And as we went through it, we realized that there were some parts of it that really should be thrown into the waste paper basket of desuetude, never to be seen, hopefully, again, because there's a better and more modern, uh, more commercially feasible, more practical way of doing business that will allow for this country to represent itself in the way that we want to be represented, which is being among the best in class. Um, and I say that almost ad nauseum, sir, because that should be the ambition of all Barbadians in all walks of life. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, that is the explanation of the legislation. And with those few words, sir, I would want to beg that it be read a second time. I'm obliged. <clears throat> Honorable Member St. Peter. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I had not originally intended to speak really on this matter, but I reflected recently on something I saw in the newspaper that caused me to remember a couple of things. What I saw was the, a presentation being made of some books by the BHTA, the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, and Miller Publishing, of a book called Island in the Sun, the story of tourism in Barbados. And I, I had cause to reflect because I remembered, I don't know, think I've forgotten, but I remembered that I commissioned that book. And <laughs> I had cause to reflect on what caused me to do that while I was president of the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association back in the early 2010s, well, between 2010 and, and 2012. And I recognize that there was a story that needed to be told. A story about an industry that, from my perspective, is sometimes maligned, sometimes takes a beating deservedly, 
But at the end of the day, an industry that needs, that needed, and I believe still needs to be explained to all of us. I asked back then Dr. Kerry Hall and uh, Professor Fraser to assist me in that regard. And Dr. Hall wrote, I think she wrote the first two or three chapters and uh, Professor Fraser wrote the remainder of the volume. And that volume traced the development of tourism in Barbados from the earliest days up until the present. And the development of the industry spoke, actually mirrored what I consider to be the development of the country. And there were some untold stories that were unearthed for the general public through the chapters in that book. For example, the, we, we often think of tourism as a Gold Coast or Platinum Coast experience, not recognizing that at the birth of tourism in Barbados, the West Coast was considered swamp inhabited by mosquitoes. Nobody wanted to be on the West Coast. Our tourism started in the city, started in the city because of the, the traffic drew, drew to the moving back and forth of military forces, but also the planters who were coming to see how our forefathers were producing. So they, they didn't come with any good intent, but they still needed some place to sleep. And so we, we had in the city taverns, inns, accommodation experiences. But after that, tourism did not extend to the West Coast. Tourism went east. And a lot of that had to do with the, 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 the fact that Barbados's climate, particularly on the East Coast, was recognized as one that would lend itself to healing and to health and to wellness. But those, Mr. Speaker, were just a few of the, uh, of the uh, pieces of information that were unearthed in the research leading to that publication. But I commissioned that publication because I recognized the importance of the industry that is the subject of this bill that we're debating this morning, I recognize the importance of that industry to the country as a whole. And I want to mention a few things briefly, because I don't intend to be overly long in, in my contribution. Tourism provides, tourism in its broadest sense, provides work for at least one third of the working population of this country. And I'm talking about in ordinary times, I'm not talking about, we, we, we see the pandemic period, particularly 2020 and early 2021 as a blip. But tourism provides employment for persons right across the board. And when I say right across the board, Mr. Speaker, I am saying, I have said before and I continue to say, Tourism provides employment for persons who have skills in almost every area. It provides employment for persons who have qualifications at all different levels. So the young man in Rose Hill who has two CSEC certificates can find can make a living, can earn money in the industry. The person with a PhD can also earn. Persons with skills in all kinds of areas can earn. And I've made the point over the years that I'm a supporter of diversification of the economy. I also recognize, having started my life in, in an audit firm, 
that there are many possible areas of economic activity, but the scope of employment opportunities tend to be very narrow, tend to require certain engineering skills, tend to require certain academic qualifications. And I'm of the view that until such time as we can raise the qualification level across the board, there will be need for the people I represent to be able to find a meaningful job, a decent job, and to be able to earn money to support themselves and to support their relatives. The ministry have the honor to lead, Mr. Speaker, just completed through the IDB a program, a piece of research really, roadmap for strategic sectors and in skills development in Barbados. Strategic sectors. And this study was conducted by Professor Andrew Downs. And after about a year of research and surveys, the project has determined that in the Barbados context, job creation and job development, these three top sectors are tourism, ICT, and energy. ICT on its own, but also ICT as cross-cutting and underpinning the development of the other sectors, not just these that I've mentioned, these are the top three, but these as well as other sectors. So ICT was a cross-cutting, even though it had an individual, a particular individual component. And the result of that study reinforced in my mind that as a country, we have to be deliberate in our approach to the tourism industry. We have to be deliberate, not just from the perspective where a lot of people's heads are at, and we used to call it getting bums in beds. That is a narrow and pretty crude approach to tourism. Crude because it does not often recognize the importance of tourism as developmental. That is to say, it does not recognize that there are significant and important linkages that are and that ought to be a part of our tourism development. Tourism is not just about bums in beds, about how many people you can get here to be on the country, beyond the island. Tourism is about, as our forefathers would say, inviting somebody to your home and letting them have a good time. Tourism is, for all intents and purposes, an export industry. But we invite the customer to come and make the purchase and deposit the funds here with us. But when I talk about narrow in terms of development or the approach to development in the tourism industry, I say that because the linkages to the energy sector, the linkages to the manufacturing sector, the linkages to the agricultural sector, linkages in ICT, linkages to domestic travel, transportation sector, are often not addressed by those who lead in the development of the sector, particularly at the private sector level. And one of the other reasons why I rose to make this small contribution to this debate is also because of something that I heard in very recent times. In recent times, 
maybe about two weeks ago, someone was heard to say that the industry is finding difficulty attracting workers in this post, well, almost post-pandemic period. And I want to respond quite briefly to that. And I respond, Mr. Speaker, while I stand and I cannot divorce myself from being the minister responsible for labor, but I also stand as a former member of the Labor Relations Committee of the BHDA. I also stand as one who has helped to lead negotiations for the association and the industry with the workers' representative. 2020 became a poster child for the narrow approach of some leaders in the tourism industry to their businesses and to the industry generally. In 2020, when the industry came to a grinding halt at the end of March, it was quite evident that employers in the tourism industry, and I say it became evident, and I'm saying that based on, the, on what could be seen, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful with my words, based on what could be seen, the evidence suggested that the employers in the industry abandoned their workers. That is what appeared to all of us. And I say to you, Mr. Speaker, and I say to the industry that I still love and that I still consider sometimes my, myself to be a part of, you cannot appear to abandon your workers and then expect that when things pick back up, they are going to be there sitting down are standing, waiting for you. This is not the Barbados of the pre-emancipation period. This is not the Barbados of the immediate post-emancipation period. This is not the Barbados of the pre-independence period. This is a 21st century Barbados. This is a time, Mr. Speaker, that there is a rising consciousness among people that they don't have to put up with what they don't want to put up with. And so I want to use this opportunity, speaking now as the minister responsible for workers and their protection in this country, to say to all employers, pick sense from what is happening in the tourism industry. Industrial relations in this country must become a partnership. And too often I see, and this is not limited to the private sector, I see it too much in the public sector as well. This fear this dislike for engaging with trade unions. Now, Mr. Speaker, I am standing here because I made a decision to join a party that was led by a labor leader that came out of a rebellion and uprising in the 1930s that established the Barbados Workers' Union in 41. I stand here as a member of a party led by a man who took the nickname Moses because the people saw him as leading them from almost slave-like conditions into what they considered to be the promised land, to, to a land of improvement, a time of improved circumstances. 
And I want to say to employers across Barbados today, the workers in your establishment are not the union's workers. And I've said this before, and I, I'm not, I cannot tire of saying it because I've not yet gotten through to as many employers as I ought to. The workers in your establishment are your workers. They are your partners. They're the ones who are joining with the money or the land or the equipment that you've put into the equation to help you to earn some profits. And there's nothing wrong with a business earning profits. Even though we're a labor party, we recognize that in order to provide employment, a business has to make profits. It has to make profits. But your workers who allow you to make profits have to be seen as partners in the enterprise. They are your workers. They are not the union's workers. The union's workers work at Solidarity House. They don't work in your establishment. They are the union's members, but they are your workers. And I'm calling on employers across this country to engage with their workers. Engage with your workers. Engage with the organizations that represent your workers. Engage in good faith. And I think it is clear through 2020 and into 2021 that this government, this Barbados Labour Party government, the real Labour Party in this country, will do all that it can to facilitate that relationship building between businesses and their owners and workers and their representatives. That is who we are as a party. And that is the position that we will continue to take in the industrial relations space in this country. The linkages that I referred to earlier are important. While tourism employs about one third of the worker force in this country, its GDP contribution is estimated to be anywhere between 35 and 40 percent when taken in its fuller context. And, and I, will, I will do something, honorable member for St. James Central that I've been, I spent a lot of years doing while helping to lead the private sector. And that is to call for tourism satellite accounting to become a reality. This bill that we are debating today speaks about service charge, funds that are used to help to market the country. But any business person, and when I say business person, I'm referring not just to the people who have degrees or professional certification. I'm talking about our grandmothers who used to know how to make two shillings stretch. Anybody who is a money manager understands that you have to see what you are getting from what you are spending. You don't just throw away money unless, like, if you're like some people, I don't know if you're a member for Church West is one of those, but if you've got foolish money, you know, like, enough, enough money. I Most of us... I don't remember if you got foolish money. Well, those of us... I'm not the term foolish. But th th those of us who, who are not even close, sometimes we don't know what to call it, so we use those kind of terms. You know, I don't know if it is because we are jealous that we don't have that kind of money, but you know, we, yeah, unfamiliar. We are unfamiliar. You mean lots of money? You mean lots of money? L extra? Lo yeah, lots, lots of extra lots, money. Lots of extra money. But yeah, not foolish money. And I, I, I'm thankful to you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you're obviously more experienced with the, you know, being in that space, the lots of money space. And I'm really, really grateful for your guidance. Um, I promise not to use foolish money in, in this chamber again. I have been tutored, and I really appreciate your tutoring. But we need to find out what is the real return to the country for the funds that we collect and spend in marketing, for the funds that we spend at the Hospitality Institute, for the funds that we spend at the University of the West Indies, because the undergraduate degree in tourism is 
is paid for. People do that degree there. There's a master's program at KFL as well. And some of our students still go to the Bahamas. We need to know what the real contribution is. And as we often say, if we're going to make good policy, the policy has to be based on good information. And I'm calling for the long-promised tourism satellite accounting to become a reality so that we can accurately understand, accurately say what is the contribution of the sector to the economy. So I, my presentation, Mr. Speaker, has, it is twofold. There's an economic contribution. But before that, there's a contribution in terms of what the industry can do for those who have worked, like myself, in the industry and those who are working in the industry. We need to know what those returns are. We know that there is some linkage with manufacturing. There is some linkage with agriculture. The fact that there is a linkage became quite evident in the early days of the pandemic. I think the country recognized at that time that the agricultural output was not purchased only by householders in this country. And so farmers went through, experienced a difficult time during 2020 because there were no visitors to the country who were consuming those agricultural products. So there is some linkage already. My position, Mr. Speaker, is that the linkage needs to be developed. From the industry perspective, it needs to be intentional and not accidental. There needs to be an intentionality about establishing linkages with other sectors because this export industry, this export industry that is tourism, has the potential to bring along a lot of other sectors along with it so that we have a much more balanced economy, a much more diversified economy. And that is necessary in a Barbados of today, a Barbados that is existing in a world that has been volatile for a while, but where the volatility seems to be increasing. And that is something that we need to pay attention to. The linkages with tourism need to extend to community tourism. It needs to extend to community tourism. The funds that are collected from the service charges that we impose, and I agree very strongly with the Honorable Member for St. James Central, that imposition, and I don't shy away from calling it an imposition, because it was an imposition, but it was an imposition on travel in an attempt to ensure that the entire burden of adjustment did not fall on the backs of workers. The people who the Honorable Member for St. James Central referred to um, the ones he said line, I think he said Jar Street. That's what it sounded like to me. But those who line at Jar Street in their BMWs, I, I, I didn't hear everything. I was trying to get my thoughts together. But I got the impression he was talking about people who were liming and drinking in big cars that came as a result of not so good activity. But we, we, we have to recognize that gone are the days where adjustment is going to be placed only on the workers of this country. And this service charge, placed as it was on travel, so for persons generally who can afford to travel, and for visitors who are coming to enjoy the high quality product that we have to offer, were asked to share in the burden. And so this government, and certainly the member for St. Peter, makes no apology for this, for the $70 charge that was imposed. 
the marketing from these resources have to include the communities of this country. As I speak, Mr. Speaker, and I believe it's probably happening all right now, it is 20 minutes to midday, I'm sure that there are visitors in six mains who are about to get some food from Braddy's. I'm also sure that in Six Mains Bay, there are a few who are swimming, as we speak, with the turtles. I am pretty confident that there are a few in Spitestone walking around. Tourism, if it is to be sustainable, has to produce benefits beyond wages have to produce benefits beyond salaries, has to bring benefit into communities. And we see some of it. But like I said before, the industry has to be intentional about it. And so I mentioned six mains. We know the story of oysters. But as you can understand, I'm going to be a little bit partial. And six men's oysters and other places need to become hubs of activity that are part of the experience that our visitors enjoy while they are here. Experiences created by us, us meaning people from the communities, experiences that we create because this is the kind of experience that we enjoy. And therefore, this is the kind of experience that we can invite somebody else to enjoy. That is what we need to do and what we need to be intentional about in relation to mark spending or marketing dollars. There is also the gullies. The Honorable Member for, for St. Michael Northeast said to me some months ago that St. Peter has lots of gullies. Gullies that many of us ran about, ran around in over the years, um, I would not have been in the mischief-making group, but I, I assume that there were some who were in that category. Mine would have been just exploring, trying not to get too much pinklers. But we have lots of gullies, and we have decided that we need to develop these spaces. There are natural spaces. There are spaces that we can enjoy, that we can hike in, that we can enjoy fruits from, that the species that exist with us, monkeys included, can also enjoy, and that we can develop and turn into spaces that we invite other people to enjoy as well. And so in, in St. Peter, the, the minister responsible for the environment has indicated that there will be piloting a gully project in St. Peter, and we hope that we can identify and roll out that plan in the next month or so. And then there's also, there are also caves in various communities. We have one in Ben Hill. We call it the Arawak Temple. It was also used by Roman Catholics who were fleeing persecution at the hands of the established church in Barbados at the time, the, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church. And that cave is part of our heritage. We've enjoyed it, those of us from the area, but we believe it is a place that we can invite other people to enjoy as well. We believe it can become a place where we not only enjoy, not only invite other people to enjoy, but where those who live in the environs of the cave, those who live in Ben Hill and Rose Hill and Pleasant Hall, can have economic benefit out of its development. And, and that is what I refer to when I, when I talk about taking tourism to the community and allowing tourism to help to build our communities. We have a space in an area, I would call it the risk in St. Peter. It is really to the north of Boscobel. 
on a high cliff, probably in between, and the other man for Christchurch West knows it, in between Cove Bay and Pico Tenerife. One of the most beautiful views in all of Barbados. And that piece of land, the, the former owner called it Monkey Jump. I know there's also Monkey Jump close to Hackleton, but this one was also called Monkey Jump. And that was bequeathed by its now late owner to the people of Barbados. And I will call for it to be made into a nice park, which is what the benefactor had, had, has instructed, and that it be made a park so that the people in the area can enjoy it, the people in the north can enjoy it, Barbadians generally can enjoy it. And after enjoying it, we can invite others to enjoy its magnificent views as well. But Mr. Speaker, we have to be intentional about how we spend the resources that we have in developing this industry. This bill, Airport Service Charge Bill, speaks essentially to funding, to funds that we're collecting to market this country. And I'm calling that as we develop the industry, as we develop the country that we are going to market, that we recognize that people are at the center of any hospitality industry by its definition. People are at the center. I'm asking that we recognize that the industry does not exist, as the Honorable Member for St. James Central often says, in splendid isolation. It does not exist in splendid isolation. And I'm also calling for a situation where as we expend these funds that we're collecting at the airport, that we remain mindful of the need to develop sustainable tourism activity within communities, taking tourism to the people, that we remain focused on that and that we be intentional about ensuring that we can develop our communities for our own benefit, for our own enjoyment, but also for the economic benefit of those of us who live in those communities. And so, Mr. Speaker, with those remarks, I support wholeheartedly this airport service charge bill and look forward to these funds being used to develop not just the industry, but to continue the development of this country that we so much love. God bless you. Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to thank your Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to thank your member for St. Peter for his call to conscience, um, especially as it relates to the relationships between the business community and the workers of Barbados in this vital sector. Um, sir, I would want to now move that you, sir, um, leave. We, 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 you get a second time already. Sorry. I beg to move, sir, that the bill be read a second time. Questions that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes aye. Mr. Speaker, sir. All right, member. Sorry. I remember.
Honourable Member Cindy M. Sanjay. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that you do not leave the chair and that the House go into committee for further consideration of this bill. <coughs> the question is that the Speaker do not leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honourable members in favour, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the yes have it. This House is now in committee. Mr. Chairman, clauses 1 to 5. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that clause 1 to find sub par. The question is that clause 1 to 5. 5 stands par. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Mm. Honorable members against, please say nay. You think the ayes have it? Clauses 6 to 11. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, sir, I beg to move that clauses 6 to 11 stand par. The question is that clauses 6 to 11 stand par. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Honorable members against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, sir, I beg to move that you report progress to his honor, the speaker, and ask for leave to... Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that you, that you, Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that you report um, passage of one bill in committee to His Honour the Speaker. The question is that we report on the passage of one bill in committee to His Honour the Speaker. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. Aye. Honourable members against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Oh. I'm in committee. I remember saying James Andrew. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the aforementioned bill be ready a third time. All those are members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the yes have it. All my members in <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that the bill be passed and cited as the airport service charge at 2022. The question is that the affirmation be, be passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This bill is passed and so cited. Order number five, sir. In the name of the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Security, to move the second reading of the Animals, Diseases and Importation Amendment Bill 2022. Honourable Member Senator Philip South. Mr. Speaker, thank you uh, for the opportunity to move the second reading of this bill. Um, I first wish to start by issuing a caution to all Barbadians that this is a matter of process and not by any means designed to de create any panic among Barbadians, particularly our pork lovers in this country, who will no doubt go into a state of frenzy if they are to feel that we can no longer have sauce on Saturdays or pickle or barbecue pigtails. So I wish, <laughs> I wish to give the country the assurance and the honorable member from St. Peter is saying it's good to hear that even though I know he wouldn't indulge, but he, care, he, he cares so much about his constituents that he's conscious of the repercussions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm equally cognizant of how my constituents would behave in St. Philip South. And so I wish to give everyone in this honorable chamber and indeed all people of Barbados 
the assurance that this is only a small amendment to ensure that the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Security is able to help us to deal with the African swine fever, which is currently in Hispaniola. And these measures are purely to mitigate, first of all, uh, the disease coming to Barbados through any means. And at the same time, educate the public as to what we are doing in order to make sure that Barbados is safe from African swine fever and that our pork farmers can be protected, even though at some point in time in the process, they will be called upon to increase the biosecurity on their farms equally as we have to do it at our ports. And so the amendment to the bill would focus um, purely, Mr. Speaker, sir, on the amendment of section two of cap 253 and a repeal and replacement of section 11 of cap 253. And I will go into the details of those during this presentation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, African swine fever as we know it to be, and many times um, people confuse and mix it up with hog cholera or African swine flu, and the two are slightly different. But African swine fever is extremely contagious, and because of this, uh, we are mandated to make sure we put measures in place to mitigate the importation of the virus into Barbados by way of imported animals, meats, or meat products. The World Organization for Animal Health, or the OIE, has considered this a disease that is notifiable, and therefore, most countries within range should take measures to mitigate against it. Uh, the disease was reported in several countries across Eastern Europe in 2007, in China and across Southeast Asia in 2018 and 2019, and in Western Europe, Belgium, Germany, etc. also. Now, because of the rapid spread of the disease, these measures are necessary in order for us to protect Barbados and the Barbadian public and indeed pork farmers. On July 29, 2021, there was a report from the Dominican Republic to the OIE that an outbreak of African swine fever had been confirmed in pigs from backyard farms. And this was the first time that this disease was identified in the Americas region since the 1970s. And Mr. Speaker, my takeaway from that is that the problem that we face is one where we have to determine how we would manage backyard pig farms because that clearly was the source of the disease in Domret and indeed um, it spread in Hispaniola. Now, Mr. Speaker, as we speak about African swine fever, we must be cognizant of the fact that meats that are imported into Barbados can invariably be processed things like bacon or sausages or burgers. And equally, we can also import the raw products to process these items. It is therefore very important for us to recognize that the risk here is in disclosure and that customs can only go as far as the information they receive. And therefore, the responsibility really falls to the importers to give prior declaration, but equally to provide information, detailed information as to the origin of the product. 
We have, Mr. Speaker, sir, a challenge when it comes to sanitary and phytosanitary decorations, where many times a container may be delayed simply because information relevant to the source of the goods or information relevant to the clearance of that container might be cumbersome, might be complex, and can create some frustration among those who are importing the goods. And then equally, there is a case of a perception where it is believed that, oh my, you can go ahead and clear the thing. We have done this several times before. Why are you delaying us? This, Mr. Speaker, sir, can pose a problem to us if now we are not as vigilant as we really need to be in handling particularly pork products or pork meat or animals coming into Barbados. It is true that the disease is not everywhere, but it is enough to say that if it has been seen in, on the Asian continent and within Europe and now close to the Caribbean region, that we must put all systems on alert in order for us to be able to protect our pork industry. Mr. Speaker, this is gonna cause for some work. And equally, it is gonna call for us to embark on a number of things in order for us to be able to manage and mitigate the importation or indeed spread of this virus. The virus is so contagious that it can be picked up if uh, you've already cooked processed pork products and the leftovers, and I'm going to put this strictly in Bajan layman terms so that everybody can understand, uh, the leftovers in a backyard pig farm rather than put it out and dispose of it, it is fed to the pigs as some people do. And once that animal picks up, any contaminated food or any feed, then that animal is prone to catching the virus, and then that is how it can spread. We in Barbados know that in order for us to increase production in pork, we use a boar in order to impregnate the sow and to get piglets. And Mr. Speaker, I just want to put this as simply as I possibly can so that people can understand. Now there is an AI program, and that too also will have its risk, but not as risky as using a boar. And the movement of a boar from a contaminated farm can also spread the disease. But it does not end there, Mr. Speaker, because a person working on a farm who's not carrying out the proper biosecurity measures by way of change of clothing, change of shoes, wearing a, 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 a coat when you're going on the farm, making sure that the, the area where you're walking is properly sanitized, shoes are properly sanitized, then this also can result in a spread of the disease. More importantly, you may have traveled to a jurisdiction where out of interest, out of business, for whatever reason, you would have traveled to a jurisdiction where you were on a farm and you did not properly sanitize your shoes, come back to Barbados, did not declare, even though the ED card now has been changed for people to present that they were on a farm. And that information, if not declared, can also lead to us being at risk of having the virus brought to Barbados. So from farm to farm, using the biosecurity measures, that if there are breach, you are at risk. But equally, from travel, if you come back and didn't properly declare, then also the risk is there. Mr. Speaker, that, sir, may sound as though, oh, this is typically another set, a layer of complicated things that 
you want to introduce to make things more difficult, etc. I hear the narrative. But then there are the economic consequences, sir, that we have to bear in mind. And I can go into many of them, but I will seek first of all, sir, to be as concise as I possibly can, hitting the hardcore facts. A farmer who invariably has a pig farm, usually not very wealthy, having to deal with the spread of African swine fever on his farm invariably is at risk of 100% wipeout. That 100% wipeout means loss of income, maybe for a prolonged period of time, can run you into years. He, not having the financial resources, will not be able to quickly adjust to a new type of business, and therefore, that farmer goes under, and his life is forever complicated, not being able to pay bills, not being able to keep staff employed, not being able to support family, and I can go on and on and on. The other side to it, sir, is that when something like this happens, where is the first call made? And the first call is invariably made just as we hear every day on the Ministry of Agriculture and the government of Barbados. And so, therefore, you get criticized. You know, Mr. Speaker, sir, yesterday I happened to hear um, today in history, and there's a program that University of the West Indies does. It comes just at the tail end of brass tacks. And the, the orator made the point that in 1950, Barbados was able to produce so much food that we were able to export to British Guyana and some other Caribbean countries. And wise, I took note of the fact that all of the measures that were used back then, this government is currently using to increase production in Barbados by putting support for livestock farming, support for crop farming. Measures that are typically in line with everything we are doing with one exception, and that is the provision of reservoirs that we are currently doing at a cost of millions of dollars so that we can help increase production and help farmers and provide growth in this sector. And I'm making this point, sir, because the only thing I find that we are good at nowadays is how we can throw rocks and how fast we can throw them uh, who we would take out in the process. And I am saying that because the information provided by the historian was such good quality information that all we needed to do now was take it and compare it to what is happening, and if we need to improve, we need to improve. But up came a caller who determined that the only response you can get from such high quality information is to bash the government and to bash ministers of agriculture. And I agree with him that some ministers of agriculture might have deserved a bashing. And I will be the first, Mr. Speaker, sir, to say that he did say this current minister is trying. But my fallout, sir, was at the point where we went on to rattle off the same old story, even though I have explained this over and over to the country, about lands that are vacant and overgrown by bush and they can grow food, and that we need to stop putting arable land into developments and all those kind of things. I have explained this so many times, Mr. Speaker, I have digressed but I deem it important to make this point. Because we cannot go forward as a country if we do not recognize the good that the government is doing to develop this sector and see each and every time to pull down. 
And we had 10 years of a government that never addressed agriculture, you know. We had 10 years of a government that dealt under a Ministry of Agriculture and Water Resources only with water. And it was not just to provide water for farmers, but to set up an edifice in the pine at millions of dollars. That is what we had, Mr. Speaker, sir. And that we have now come to a point where we are dealing at the foundation. And that is why I speak about fixing your micro fundamentals in order that you can achieve your macro objective. This is what I mean. And that the caller then went on to say that we are not doing enough to promote agriculture and to provide food security in this country when we have now made available 400 acres of land for farmers at river with a six million gallon pond. We have now made down at Mount Poyer 76 acres of land, 45 acres. The Honorable Member for St. Lucy can confirm, already planted up, providing 1,000 gallon water tanks for the farmers, sir. Entering them into agriculture without them having to put up a dime. Mr. Speaker, I have a long list of requests from people who want to get into farm, and you know what it is they want to do? They want to get into pig rearing. Pig rearing. Chickens. And we have set aside our Mount Poyer, a space for them to do livestock farming at the government providing all of the inputs to give them a start, Mr. Speaker, sir. <laughs> 10 years of a government, 10 long years, nothing so took place under that administration. And I usually don't present in this chamber, Mr. Speaker, sir, by trying to bash every time a former Minister of Agriculture, former Minister of Agriculture, who happened to have a very good social understanding with me. But I draw the line when it comes to the country. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I am appalled that the caller did not even make reference to the fact that at Bath in St. John and at Wakefield, the Honorable Member for St. John is here, at Wakefield, that we have also put in place close to another 100 acres of land for the Rastafarians of Barbados to go and plant crops. And guess what is happening, Mr. Speaker, sir? The government is putting in all the inputs, including the water and the drip system and the tanks, and giving them the planting material, no cost to them, sir. <laughs> and at Wakefield, it's called Honorable Member Robert Phoenix, Project Phoenix Under the Feed Program. 30-something young people from St. John, given an opportunity where the government cultivated all the land, cleared the area, put in the base, going put in the base for the tanks just now, and provide the 1,000 gallon tanks, and they are already planting, sir. And the government provided all the, the, the planting material. And I, I had to digress to make this point so that we would understand that the information that the historian mentioned that took place in 1950 is repeating itself today. So that, Mr. Speaker, sir, back to the point I was making. First point to call will be government. So that the fellow that gets his farm wiped out because people did not follow the biosecurity measures, or we did not, as a government, respond fast enough because this disease is not near Barbados as yet. Although I consider if it's near Hispaniola, or if it's in Hispaniola, it is near Jamaica, it's near Barbados. But to the extent that we have not 
been exposed to the risk as yet. What we are seeking to do is get ahead of the curve. And therefore, we are putting these measures in place, sir, to make sure that Barbados is protected from any chance of having the virus imported into this country. And that is the reason why, Mr. Speaker, sir, we are making this amendment to give the veterinary services the power to ban, if necessary, the importation of pork products or animals from any jurisdiction that may pose a risk. Now, Mr. Speaker, that is the economic side. But then we also have other complex issues, Mr. Speaker, sir, because you have the economic side as they would impact the farmers. Barbados has a major processing plant, a major processing plant, Mr. Speaker, that does burgers, hot dogs, bacon, the works. And if we were to expose this country to risk, that plant also will be at risk of either closing down, laying off hundreds of people, and going out of business simply because we would not be able to provide enough pork for them to continue at scale. So that also is a risk that we need to take into consideration, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, sir, we have currently a situation, and I have raised this at Cabinet before, and it's a matter that we have to get back to, where pork is actually imported in Barbados when we are producing enough pork to the extent that one producer called his pork proper pork and said he knows his pigs personally. <laughs> and if we can have that kind of PR in order to sensitize Barbadians to using local pork, I am indeed saddened but concerned that we can have so many cuts, uh, different cuts of pork imported into Barbados under many different excuses, sometimes justifiable, sometimes not so justifiable, but that we are importing pork to compete with local production is something that I am addressing. And that I, my language is very clear this morning, Mr. Speaker, sir. Because given what is taking place with Russia and Ukraine, I am already on the front foot and dealing with how we can increase overall production in the sector, giving us double-digit growth in the sector, but at the same time doing what I feel responsible for, and that is the empowerment and enfranchisement of Barbadians in, in, in agriculture. And Mr. Speaker, I cannot allow for imported pork to compete with proper pork. I can't. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, we're going to have to draw a line in the sand and determine what we're going to do about this problem. Certainly, we're going to be more vigilant as it relates to pork and pork products coming in from here on. And this process started since last year when we took this matter to Cabinet in August. Well, Mr. Speaker, many of our pork farmers are under severe pressure. Pressure from the increasing cost of feed, pressure from competing imported pork, pressure from being able to use potable water at the cost that it was being provided at, sir. And that I know you will always be criticized no matter what you do. But I always look for the good in everything, and I look at the broader picture, and I also look at who will benefit. And the overall benefit to Barbados, Mr. Speaker, sir, is coming in large-scale production in the livestock subsector, where the dairy farmers and the pork farmers are now enjoying a rate of $1.80 from $4.66 to as high as $7.66 to everybody paying $1.80 in their production, thus reducing their costs. And Mr. Speaker, if we can keep these things going, and this is a government that has gone out and done everything that is asked of it 
in order for us to be able to meet the expectations of people who responded to us in every election. And I find it hard, sir, to accept that in spite of all that we are doing, and the evidence is there to support it. So this is no pie in the sky, airy fairy talk, where I'm going to come with some lofty ordeals that people are still waiting to see. And I've heard and seen some comments criticizing my ministry, my staff, and myself about talking about things and waiting to see them. And I don't know if a blind man on a trotting horse sitting backwards can see that rates drop from 766 to $1.80. A blind man can see that. And I don't understand why it is that you start to get so much pushback on issues where you are making things better for the persons involved and for the economy and the country as a whole. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I want to address, sir, what we need to do in order for us to continue this process. Because this all is going to tie in to good governance. I've mentioned earlier that I have a long list of persons who want to do pig farming at River, Mount Poyer, St. John at Bath, some all places, St. Lucy, St. Andrew, right across Barbados. Sir, if we are to meet those expectations, this amendment and these measures, sir, will be at the core of whatever we are doing, or else we run the risk of putting government's investment and investment in our people at risk, and we simply cannot do that. And so, Mr. Speaker, we are about to make sure that all the persons who have expressed an interest in doing pork farming will now be facilitated at Montpoya in St. Lucie, at Bath in St. John, at River in St. Philip, sir. And that there are some places in St. Andrew, Bordens is one, that we are also looking at to facilitate these farmers. These are all farmers, sir, who are under the feed program. The feed program was conceptualized and delivered in May of 2019 as the ministry's flagship agriculture program, where our target is to train and empower and enfranchise some 2,000 Barbadians, starting them off as small farmers in livestock farming and crop farming, and then moving them up gradually to larger farmers. Why is doing this, sir? We are also bringing along our what we consider large farmers, those who have 30 acres and 40 acres and all the way up, to make sure that as we work towards increasing growth, we are keeping the large farms going whilst we bring along the smaller ones in the feed program, thus allowing for them also to, one, yearn towards reaching that higher level and at the same time learn from those who are well-established and experienced. And Mr. Speaker, we have to bring back to Barbados now the GILT program where we are saying that once we have breeders specifically set up across the island just to produce piglets, and that farmers would have access to those piglets, then we can start to get the growth that we need in order for us to increase the production of pork in Barbados and cut out most of what we are importing, if not all. The regional governments, the CARICOM heads of government, attended the Agri-Investment Forum in Guyana. And I sat at the opening ceremony, and I was very pleased it's very hard to explain the emotions that occupy my body when I listen to speech after speech, where for the first time, and I have been following regional politics, the CSME, politics in Barbados, politics globally. I have 
passion and a love for politics. But what I saw last Thursday at that opening ceremony is historic. Because every single head of government committed to reaching the target of reducing the CARICOM food import bill by 25% by the year 2025. In order for this to be achieved, we have to make sure we increase production in each jurisdiction. And therefore, we have to make sure we increase production in Barbados by way of pig farming and poultry farming as well, looking to see how we can assist the dairy farmers and as well, crop production. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've mentioned all the plans already that we've got in place. And therefore, I just want to let Barbadians know that they have a role to play in this process as well. Because if we are going to allow imported pork to compete with locally produced pork, many times, out of just wanting to import because sometimes the price is so low. You can store and store as much as, it, as you possibly can. But Mr. Speaker, we have to look up and ask where is the national pride. And we have to do this knowing full well, sir, that these young people who have approached my ministry do not have at this present time any source of income and cannot find employment under the circumstances that we are currently asked to exist under. And the conflict between Russia and Ukraine will not make it easier. And therefore, it will be fine for us to continue to do what we have to do to empower these young people and get them going. But when they cannot have market access for the port, then they too will be set back and have a major problem. The other problem that we are going to face, sir, is that we're going to have to put all the biosecurity measures around all of these small farmers as well. And we are currently doing a mapping exercise, sir, to find all of the backyard farms in Barbados. And so we have to put resources in the extension services in order for us to be able to find all of these backyard farms. This is not a simple exercise. And we will work with the Ministry of Health because their inspectors go out. So their inspectors will be able to tell us quickly where some of these backyard farms are. But equally, our responsibility is to be able to find them ourselves in order for us to be able to look at the operations and help improve them. This, along with PSAs to the public, we've started this process. Um, we held a press conference addressing this issue of African swine fever last year. Then the veterinary services and the senior veterinary officer would have done several videos through public affairs and I wish to thank the honorable member for Christchurch East, who is Minister of Home Affairs and, public and Information. And we have also done a series of interviews to help sensitize Barbadians and educate them as to the risk involved and how we can mitigate the spread. And then we have also put in place, Mr. Speaker, sir, all the testing equipment where we now have the PCR testing facility so that we can do the PCR testing. And remember, this disease also is contracted through the mucous membrane. So testing we will have to do using PCR equipment and the rapid antigen equipment as well. Because if a farmer calls and say that they have an animal that is sick or they just had an animal that died, we have to use the rapid antigen to see quickly what is going on. And then any tests that we take in Barbados, we would also be sending over to the OIE for further examination and analysis to see exactly what is happening, and then to be able to put us in a better position. 
What I want to say to Barbadians is that we must not hide information. Um, this government started early. There is no African swine fever within CARICOM at this point in time. And I want to reiterate that point because the last thing I want is for anybody to start thinking that there's African swine fever. But I also want to make the point that we have to avoid the risk because it can lead to 100% wipeout and Barbados is a small place. And then we're gonna have to look at disposal of carcasses. And so now you're gonna have to have mass graves in order to dispose of carcasses in order to, eat, to be able to prevent the spread. Mr. Speaker, sir, this responsibility is all of our own. This is not solely the responsibility of the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Security, but certainly the responsibility of every single Barbadian, whether you are a pork farmer or not. And Mr. Speaker, we are going to be producing some more PSAs to educate Barbadians. And at the same time, we are going to be doing direct contact with farmers, looking at how we could improve their setup. And I did mention the mapping exercise. But we are putting back into this country greater production of pork as well because there are some farmers, and there's a major farm right now in Barbados that is under severe pressure because he can't compete with the imported pork, which is taking up most of his market share. And I'm sharing this with the public because I believe that there must be a consciousness in Barbados, and the Honorable Member for St. Michael East always make this point, and he's one of the speakers in this chamber, sir, that I have a lot of time listening to because I recognize the direction that he goes in, but I equally recognize the profound statements that he makes whenever he is addressing things that would interfere with the social fabric of this country and the economic disenfranchisement of people in this country who otherwise will not be able to participate in the ownership structure of Barbados unless they are given a fair chance to compete. I have gone on record several times saying that under a system of free enterprise and democracy, that all of us are allowed to compete, but nobody owes you anything. But equally, a government has a responsibility to make sure people are given a leg up, and that that responsibility goes beyond a talk that says, we will give you a leg up, but we have to make sure it's sustainable by reducing outside competition, sir. And that is our government's responsibility, and that is the responsibility that we seek to undertake as a government of Barbados, being very well led by the Prime Minister, who now is a global leader. Nice. The Honourable Member for Christchurch East is telling me recognized, but I am very clear in my thoughts that she is a global leader. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to make it abundantly clear that if we do all of this and people intend to cheat the system, the pain and suffering that will be caused upon those people who will be knocked out of business and will not be able to recover in any short time will be severe. And Mr. Speaker, bringing in pork products and not declaring them at the port, sir, will do an injustice to our people. Importing pork products and don't want to give proper disclosure will bring an injustice to our people, sir. Wanting to trade in jurisdictions where the ministry is flagged as jurisdictions that you should not import from will do an injustice to this country, sir. Wanting to speed up the process for clearance without providing enough information, timely information, and being cooperative will do an injustice to this country, sir. We recognize the pressure that is brought to bear 
on all of us to be as nimble as we possibly can in order to facilitate the ease of doing business. I am on board with that. But the moment you seek to break down and bypass the regulatory process, sir, is where we are going to create problems. For example, there are protocols to follow, sanitary and phytosanitary protocols. If you bring in any meat products, there are protocols to follow, particularly when it's coming from certain jurisdictions. Everybody may have an angst to get the product out the port, I understand. But if you have that angst, start the preparation in advance and don't wait till the container comes. Also, the measures that we are looking to put in place with pre-clearance and trusted trader programs that I'm currently discussing with the Comptroller of Customs will go a long way in getting containers cleared. But I want everyone to understand that there are certain protocols we must follow, and we should not seek in any way to ask the ministry to get around those protocols. Plants, for example, have many diseases and pests. If they're coming from certain jurisdictions, unless there's a pest risk analysis and a disease analysis done prior, the product is going to be subject to scrutiny. Animals have diseases. We just had to put a ban on poultry products coming out of the U.S. because of avian influenza. Last year, we had to do the same with chicken wings coming out of the UK. And it goes on and on and on and on and on, sir. And so we are seeking, therefore, to expand our pork industry, provide greater opportunities for people to enter, to be able to participate in the economic structure of this country, and at the same time protect this country from, first of all, African swine fever and the spread thereof. Mr. Speaker, the amendment we are seeking to make is that Section 2 of CAP 253, Section 2 of the Animal Disease and Importation Act, CAP 253, and in this act is referred as, to as Principal Act and is amended by A, deleting the definition communicable animal disease, I'm substituting with the following. Communicable animal disease means a disease specified in the schedule. And in the schedule, there's a whole long list of disease that are flagged for us to monitor and take action if necessary. And then inserting in alphabetical order the following definition. Disease means communicable animal disease and deleting, C, deleting the definition disease. Um, we are also going to repeal and replace section 11 of CAP 253, and section 11 was perhaps about a paragraph or too long. Uh, that section 11, 11 will be amended um, to say the minister may by order amend the schedule. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, those are the amendments that we will be making. I have, Mr. Speaker, the schedule. There's no need for me to go through all 26 of these diseases, except to say that they're here now in the statute. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate that uh, this is a call upon all Barbadians for us to play our part. And so uh, I beg to move, Mr. Speaker, that this bill be now passed. Read, read no read a second time, sir. All I remember was saying, Michael Substantial. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support this Animals, Diseases and Importation Amendment Act. I realize that our countries in the region often have to be catching up and have to be closely following 
uh, and have to be very in tune to what is happening internationally as it relates to disease that affects human beings, but also diseases that affect animals, that affect livestock, um, that impact the country's production and produ productive capacity, its capacity to feed our people, and our capacity to involve and engage um, Barbadians in the productive sectors, including and especially the agriculture sector. So I'm pleased to see that the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security uh, is taking these proactive steps, and I want to echo the minister in repeating and reinforcing that there is currently no African swine fever in Barbados. Let me take the opportunity to reinforce that because I know sometimes when, um, when these things are uttered that sometimes misinformation can take hold. So I'm happy to see these proactive steps. I also welcome the update um, from the honorable member on the measures that are being taken, the steps that are being taken in the ministry to ensure that agriculture becomes once again a sector that is at the forefront of our economic production, but also at the forefront of our drive to enfranchise Barbadians. There's a lot of work to do. The ministry has started on, on a path. Uh, I particularly like the path that has been started uh, along Pi Plantation Road, uh, where we've been able to clear that area, that area that it, it, it now represents an opportunity for residents of the area uh, and what we're in the process of doing. And I thank the officers in the Ministry of Agriculture and Food and Nutrition Security for being available and being engaged in the process, the officers at BADMC. Um, that area has moved, is in the process of moving from being one that has been the source of fires during the dry season, of floods during the wet season, of all kinds of plagues that have befallen the residents of that area. And now, thanks to several ministries, we've been able to clear that, that area. And I hear and welcome and expect the promise of the officers to make sure that we keep it low uh, so that it does not, um, these issues don't recur. But now it also represents an opportunity for, um, as part of our community agriculture project, for people who live in the area to be able to have access to plots of land, uh, to be able to have access um, as well to enclosed farming practices. I don't want to preempt what the officers will be seeking to introduce. But suffice it to say that we have high expectations um, of the member and of his officers for being able to bring agricultural production to that community and to take an area um, that was really a kind of a mini jungle um, and to be able to bring farming practices, to be able to bring sustainable farming practices, to be able to make sure that uh, we are not losing any of the, we are not, we are not putting in jeopardy the small water course, we are not losing any of the important um, any of the important plants that, that are there, but also that it represents uh, an opportunity for people in the area. Uh, and so this is one of the many projects that we see and encourage and want to see the results of uh, from this ministry. So I thank the Honorable Member. I have a couple small points to make on the topic of how we address the issue of the treatment of animals in general, uh, and how we address the issue of protection when it relates to food consumption. Because I always say that there, there's a reason that we talk about food and nutrition security. We're not just looking at whether food is available, but whether people are able to consume it in a way that is health-giving to our bodies. And so, one of the things that I've always considered a gap is the extent to which we as a Barbadian people, we as a Republic of Barbados, no Republic of Barbados, are also able to understand and monitor what we are consuming. Now, we are able to read all kinds of assessments of food products. 
We are able to see from the US Food and Drug Administration and from other similar bodies what, um, how these f certain foods will affect us. And I'll give an example, since it is the only thing that I eat. Um, I'm, I'm a fish eater, sir. Uh, and that's very specific because I do not, I eat only thin fish. Member for St. Michael Southeast will, will sympathize as well as a member for St. John. Um, no, no shellfish and no fish with skin. So thin fish and scale fish. And so, and so in the course of that um, diet, that nutrition lifestyle, um, one of the things that one is always, must always monitor is whether the fish that we catch, that we consume, whether it is healthy and why. Because we hear all the time of these categories of fish that have higher levels of mercury, that are exposed to certain elements um, in deep water, in open water, and so on. And really, it seems to me that a lot of what we are doing in our consumption is guesswork. Because I don't know whether the fish that I consume, that I buy from oysters or, or that I buy from, from anywhere, how that is categorized in terms of safe consumption. I say that to say that I believe that we in Barbados and probably in the region, the minister was just talking about um, the meeting that I followed very closely from my vantage point, um, because we all in the region have high hopes for these kinds of meetings. We don't have high hopes for the meeting. We have high hopes for the results. We have high hopes for the collaboration and the functional cooperation that goes on at the level of CARICOM and the wider Caribbean region to ensure that we have food and nutrition security for the people of Barbados that involves the economic activity of the people of Barbados. So to say that we don't just want to be able to eat and eat safely and eat well, but we want to make sure that we're able to do that as a result of the economic activity of local farmers and producers and so on. So that is what we want to come out of this meeting. Um, I say through you to the honorable member because we are watching closely and I think it was a very good start. I watched with interest the MOUs that were signed between different countries uh, and I think that we're looking for great results. But I will say that there's another area of functional cooperation that we need to look at and that is to be able at the regional level to say something about the food that we consume, to say something as the US Food and Drug Administration does about how healthy or what risk may come up from time to time in the consumption of this food. The levels of mercury in fish, just one example. I don't know how that is being monitored. I don't know where it is being monitored. I know that, I know that the, the levels of fish that people in the US and in the UK and so on have access to, those are monitored. But I can't, I can't say that I know how we are tracking this information. And I think it is a lot for, for us to be able to do at the local level. I think that this is one of the areas that at the level of CARICOM, at the level of the region, that we need to be able to say something about. And we have a similar issue when it comes to, um, to, to food that is being imported. You know, once I saw on the label on the outside of a box of cereal not to be sold in the United States. And I thought, oh, so who it is that we have over here that can eat something that is not safe to be eaten by the people that y'all have over there? What, what is it about the people who live in this part of the world that says that we are, well, we are happy to eat something that y'all have decided is not safe for British or Americans or other people to eat? And so I am concerned as well that even though something is packaged and stamped and shipped off, that we seem to believe that we have to take it as it is. 
and that we do not have a role to play in making sure that whatever is in that box is something that Barbadians should be eating. Because I don't see how something that Americans or whoever else should not be eating that I should be eating or my child should be eating. I think that we need to be able to contribute to this area, to this topic, in such a way that we are saying something definitive about what is safe for Barbadians to consume, whether it is farmed locally, fished locally, or imported. I am not satisfied that we have all that information. I saw recently a discussion in the public domain where the Fair Trading Commission had finally given a perspective on this question of what claims can be made for certain kinds of health supplements. And I say finally because for many, many years before entering this place, I would see these claims flying around about what certain drugs or what certain products can do. And really, they were bordering on the, into the realm, they were creeping into the realm of medicine. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't products. I mean, I, the amount of bush tea that I drank, the amount of aloes that I had to swallow on a Saturday morning. I mean, and I believe in the health giving properties of these things. But I'm saying that you have to be able to stand by the claims that you make to the public of Barbados. And so similarly, as we regulate food, or as we should begin to more closely regulate as a region, the food that we consume, I think we also have to make sure that when people get in the public domain and make certain claims about certain products, that these products actually do what they claim to be able to do. I saw during COVID that lots of people were sending around advice about the kinds of things that people should consume in order to, to address their respiratory health. Now, I believe that in general, and I saw recently that the medical, some members of the medical profession made this point, I believe that in general, that one of the things that we need to do, um, and Mr. Speaker, you'll forgive me if, if uh, I'm not hearing my own ears over some of the um, banter at the end of the room, um, but one of the things that, that I saw was that people were making claims about what certain things could, how certain weeds and herbs and so on could respond to COVID. And that was dangerous. Because while I believe that we need to keep ourselves in good shape, and we know that there are certain vitamins and minerals and even local products that can do that, I also think that we need to take a bit further the work that has been done by some in the Rastafari community and others to actually certify these things. There's a gentleman that, um, from the north, a member of the Rastafari community who has for, for a long time been sharing his wisdom about what he has found. Um, I, saw, I see that he has begun to document that, but I think that this kind of learning perhaps should now enter a space where we could all benefit from it or we could all test it and validate it and make sure that people are making good choices when they make choices um, about these kinds of products. Now, the reason that this is important is that the piece of legislation before us tells us essentially, and the way that I think about it, it tells us, it helps us understand whether an item or, a, or a food will kill us quickly, but we don't know what will kill us slowly. By that I mean we know if something is of immediate harm or immediate risk to us, um, like the African swine fever, but we have less information about anything that is imported or anything that we, that we find on our tabletops. That after a time might not be the best for us. And how, why else is this important? This is also important because we also have high incidences of certain kinds of illness. We have high incidences of breast cancer among women, um, 
of actually a, a, a quite a young age as compared with other regions, other jurisdictions. And one of the things we also need to be able to understand is what are some of the environmental causes? What might be some of the practices or the habits or the elements that are getting into our food systems and our food supply that are causing us harm that we might not be well aware of because we're not doing the adequate testing, we're not doing the adequate investigation. I saw it, I, so I think that in addition to this kind of legislation, that we also need to open up the space, and I, and I reiterate at the regional level because I think that as a matter of capacity, we may not be able to manage it all ourselves, um, country to country. Now, sir, there's another area of this um, issue of treatment of animals and the, and, and the role that they play um, that I also want to flag here. And it's one that I've discussed with the member for some time. And I want to say from the outset, sir, the following. It is possible to care about people and animals at the same time. It is possible to care about the welfare and well-being of people, the people that we all represent, and animals at the same time. Why do I say that? I say that to preempt the notion that we are here talking about the safety or the protection of animals and people are suffering. It is possible to care about and to address both at the same time. And as a government, we have to do that. And in fact, I would venture that the true test of any society, of any people, is the extent to which their care for the most vulnerable creatures among us, the true test of us as a society, is the extent to which we care for and protect the most vulnerable creatures among us. Now, I know that there's a big debate open in all kinds of places about why we should protect dogs and cats more than we should protect pigs and cows. And I, I, I don't, I'm not aiming to get into that today because arguably you should protect them all. Even if you mean to eat a creature does not mean that it should be mistreated until you eat it. In fact, the fact that you will later consume it, if you are so inclined, I'm not, the fact that you will later consume it increases the argument that you should treat it better. So the principle that I'm about to apply applies equally to cats, dogs, lizards, horses, cows, pigs, all, all, all creatures. And in fact, the people who study such things argue that pigs are among the most intelligent four-legged creatures. But I do not wish to digress because this conversation, this, this, this dialogue could go in all kinds of directions. But I want to address the issue, sir, quickly of animal protection. And I also want to address the issue of responsible ownership. And I'll say what I mean. The Honorable Member for St. Peter, when he spoke earlier, spoke about the rights of workers. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. He spoke about the notion that however workers are treated in the best of times, in your best of times as an employer, um, and however, when you come to the worst of times, you're going to find out what, how workers really felt about what you call those best of times. And we're seeing that all over the world, that people are taking all kinds of decisions about whether they want to return based on how they feel that they were valued. And I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with the question of the rights of workers and how we treat those rights of workers. I also believe that any conversation on rights comes with a conversation on responsibility, always. And I feel that we have to balance that conversation, always. We seem to think that whenever we talk about rights, we can only talk about rights. 
and that we should not at the same time talk about what are the responsibilities that accompany those rights. I think that responsible citizenship, responsible governance is about talking about them both at the same time. And equally for this topic, sir. So I want to start by saying that I and many other Barbadians are concerned about the enforcement of animal protection legislation in Barbados. Now, I always say that you can tell a lot about people by the way they treat the living things around them. And we seem to have, and I think it is improving, but I think that because in great part, I believe, of our history, where we, as descendants of formerly enslaved people, were fighting to prove that we were human and not animal, that we somehow seemed to believe that we then could treat the animal any way we wanted. I'm not a historian, but as an economist, it is my job to understand why people do what they do. And what has been encouraging me recently is that I think we are evolving from that. I, I see more and more that there's an appreciation for how animals are treated. But I also see many animals who I dare say some of them have been released. Um, some of them have been, um, have been dumped. Some of them have been dumped with the express wish or desire or result that they die. And so they haven't been surrendered to a shelter. They've been dumped in a, they've been carried to a dump. They've been dropped in a quarry. They've been shut up in a box. They have simply, somebody has just opened a gate and let them walk off without knowing or caring whether they live or die. These are living things. It seems to me that the legislation that we have is adequate. And even were it not, I am advised by the responsible ministry, by the minister, that amendments to that legislation are underway to strengthen it. And I think that's important. But I think one of the other issues that we have, as we have across several of the areas of the ministries of government, is an enforcement one. And so I think that we need to be able to set up systems for people, for example, who find it difficult to hold on to their animals. Even if we don't care for the animals themselves, which I hope we do, we certainly have to care for the repercussions. We certainly have to care for, the, for what happens when you have scores of stray animals roaming the streets. And so I would like to see some more attention paid to this issue of animal protection, not just when it comes to dumping animals, but also when it comes to how we treat the animals that are in our care. I grew up in a Barbados where you get a dog and you tie it up in the yard. And at the end of the day when you've eaten, you feed the dog whatever is left over. What I'm about to say may not win me many friends, but I think it needs to be said. I think that if you add, acquire a living thing, add it to your household, I do not understand why you would so do and then leave it tied up in the sun, in the rain, without shelter. Sometimes the water goes, nobody um, comes back to water the animal, nobody checks to see if the animal has fleas has tick fever. I don't think that that, to put it another way, if you're going to have an animal for that purpose, just don't bother have the animal. I think that we have to get, if we believe that we are evolving as a society, that we have to understand that these creatures feel just like we do and that they require protection. Now, I know that there's some things that have happened during COVID. We had people 
who did not know who they were, how they were going to next feed themselves. They did not know how they were going to next feed their children. And so the animals that they were caring for naturally were the ones who were at the bottom of that list. Um, and so I do think that, 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 that we have to work with the third sector to come up with steps to be taken where people find that that is a challenge. Um, and so I think that there are, there's space in the legislation, but also in the way that we practice what we're doing to strengthen the level of animal protection. I know that the Honorable Member for St. Joseph is probably in front of me thinking, well, I, my enforcement resources for the things that affect people are stretched, and you want me to send resources for the things that do not affect people or that affect people to a lesser extent. I know that there are enforcement issues. And so what I'm calling for is for partnerships with some of those agencies that may be able to help support government's enforcement capacity. I know there are enforcement issues across all of the agencies that have to enforce. But I do think that we can't simply say there are enforcement issues and leave it alone. We have to address this issue of animal protection because it will only get worse if we do not make it clear that it is something that needs to be addressed. And I don't think this is an area where, unless you have deliberate harm being caused, I don't think this is an area where we need to bring down the hammer in every case. In many cases, you need to support people in what they're trying to do um, and help them understand how they're causing harm. But the other part of this that I will quickly get to in my two minutes that are left um, is the issue of responsibility. The issue of responsible ownership of animals. You know, many times I see horses, animals that have been, may have lived out their useful life to whoever the owner was and the owner has sent them off to given them to a child or given them to somebody else to somebody else who clearly does not have the capacity to care for them. And I think that if you're a responsible owner and you have, are caring for an animal that is no longer of use to you in whatever way it was, that you also have responsibility to pass it on in circumstances where it will not be harmed or mistreated or starved to death um, because you no longer has use, have use for it. But there's also responsible ownership when it comes to the issue of dog owners. I have three large animals. I know sometimes it can be difficult to keep them inside, to, keep, to get them to do what you want. Um, but we also have to make sure that we protect the community. So those of us who want to own larger animals that, may, that have the potential to do harm in the wrong circumstance, we have a responsibility to keep them on a leash when they're out, out of um, out of the environment, out of the um, enclosure of our property. Um, we have a responsibility to make sure that they are not roaming and are not able to harm others. I had a conversation with a gentleman a, few, a couple weeks ago. We were talking about owning dogs. And he said to me, oh, well, you know, I have a Rottweiler that is about 150 pounds. And, you know, he goes out at night and comes back, goes for a walk at night and comes back when, when he's ready. And I thought, but hang on. Mr. Speaker, if you were somewhere in the constituency closing up, ending up your rounds at six, seven o'clock in the evening, eight, nine o'clock, and you looked down a dark alley and saw a 150 pound dog staring back at you, sir. I, you know, I would not even like to think about the kind of less dignified reaction that you might have. Because even though I love these creatures, I understand that they one can cause harm, and two are frankly scary to look at. And so I think that people who own dogs from two pounds to 200 pounds have a responsibility to make sure that they cannot do harm to others. My father, sir, used to walk every morning used to go for a morning constitutional. And he stopped after that lady um, was killed in the area 
that he used to walk. It is a horrifying thing, I would imagine, to be faced with that kind of attack. And so I think while we argue for the protection of animals, that we must, we also have to make sure that people are responsible owners of dogs, of horses, of cows, of sheep. I have had to pull over, sir, and go and get a bucket and pour some water and give to some animals that are just tied out and are clearly are dehydrated and dying of thirst and so on. And where am I going, sir, and why am I going on about this? Because it comes back to the point that the member who introduced this bill was making earlier about the quality of the product that we have, about how we rear livestock, how we raise creatures to ensure that you have a quality product. But it also comes down to how people's view us as a people. That matters. So if we are not concerned about how we treat each other, I think that we have to be concerned about how we fit into the global conversation on some of these matters. And so I rose, sir, simply to give my support to this Animal Disease and Importation Amendment Act to the extent that it protects the livestock industry, to the extent that it protects the well-being of farmers, of animals. But I think that we have to go further in that protection. I think that if we really, truly want to consider ourselves an evolved society, um, that we can walk and chew gum, that we can address the bread and butter issues that are affecting Barbadians, their capacity to live and work, um, and to be able to afford the necessary goods and services. We have to address that always, every day when we wake up, every morning. But it's not a zero-sum game. Because we care about our fellow Barbadians does not mean that we do not, should not also care about the creatures, the animals that we have around us to feed us, to protect us, to give us company, to give us services in the case of people who are living with disabilities. And so I look forward to my future conversations with the Honorable Member. Uh, I am confident that we will see efforts to enhance the enforcement of animal protection laws, and I vow my partnership and my support uh, in assisting the government in those efforts. I'm obliged to you, sir. Mr. Speaker, um, I rise uh, to wrap up this debate and to respond to some of the issues raised by the Honorable Member for St. Michael South Central. Uh, first of all, to give the assurance that Pine Road project um, will definitely be executed and that this will provide an opportunity for the constituents of St. Michael South Central. In addition to the Pine Basin project, which um, is currently ongoing, and that um, the shade houses that are coming in from Guyana, some of them will be erected at Pine Basin so that the entire St. Michael area, that entire corridor, every single area in St. Michael will have access to some form of opportunity within the Pine Basin and within the Lears project for uh, people to be given an opportunity. And I don't use the word employed because I never associated employment with myself until now. Previously, I associated myself with owning a business and being able to generate employment so that I always felt that my contribution to this country uh, should be by way of how I can empower and enfranchise people. And therefore, I believe that it, by natural course, I ended up here. Um, but just to say that the
projects within the St. Michael Corridor, um, opportunities for ownership in Barbados will be provided for the people in St. Michael, Christchurch, St. George, St. James, St. Thomas. Those areas, um, we've already got programs in St. Lucie and St. Andrew and St. Peter, St. John, and St. Philip, Christchurch. So that there's an opportunity for all Barbadians. Um, I long recognize that the easiest way, uh, I believe the Honorable Member for St. Michael South Central would agree with me, that not every person that wants to participate can afford to own a hotel or restaurant, but can easily transition into ownership, into agriculture, simply by having some land and the tools that are required and the planting material, and that person equally can become an economic titan in Barbados over time. And then uh, the honorable member mentioned the Project Care program, which we are developing. Uh, during the AgriFest this weekend, you should see a list of all the things that fall under Project Care. And this speaks to how we expand the Lears project into where Barbadians in every community in Barbados um, will have an opportunity to do some form of kitchen garden or community garden. And the ministry would provide the support if it is technical support and under certain circumstances where we would do the cultivation and provide the planting material. Um, in terms of food sovereignty, and I understand very well what the Honorable Member meant when she spoke about the inputs and the things that we are consuming. And this is an extremely valid point because one of the things that we grapple with, and the Prime Minister speaks to it all the time, is antimicrobial resistance, where we are consuming things, but we don't know all of the inputs. I had a conversation with the Ministry responsible for, it's the Ministry of Trade, uh, where they look into all of the practices, the labeling, disclosures, all of those things. And we have a new trend where, trend that is developing, where products are coming in in foreign languages, languages that the agents, majority of the agents don't speak. So when they go to the supermarket and look at the labels, they don't know what is in there. So a lot of times we're consuming things that we don't know about, and this is a major problem, and I thank the member for raising it. Um, and we are certainly under the sanitary and phytosanitary measures that are coming. And equally with the establishment, if indeed this comes to pass, the establishment of a single unit. And why I'm referring to a single unit is because we established the Fair Trading Commission to take away those activities from under central government and allow the independence of the officers in order that they may be able to function. And I believe that a strong SPS system should allow for a single agency similar to what Canada does in order for us to be able to allow people to function without layers of bureaucracy as well, or indeed political interference at times. The animal welfare, I share the honorable member's position. Uh, we have, to my mind, a good piece of legislation that deals with the prevention of cruelty to animals. But sometimes it is a lack of will because it's an animal, and therefore the effort is not there. Um, that, to my mind, has to be addressed. We have to do better where that is concerned. Uh, the proof of ownership is a major problem, and I've had this conversation with the Royal, with uh, the Barbados Police Service. Now, back then, it was the Royal Barbados Police Force, and we are looking in, we are looking into how we can strengthen this, in order that the issues that were raised very eruditely by the Honourable Member for St. Michael Central can be addressed. I have the same concerns. I saw a video going around. Um, on social media. The Honorable Member for the City was on brass stacks at the time, where people were complaining about how a monkey was mistreated. And that thing generated a whole lot of conversation in this country. So there's a consciousness in Barbadians about how we treat animals. It's just that 
you get cases where people feel that it's okay because it's a pet. And um, we were able to deal with that situation by at least having the person arrested. So wherever we can, we are still able to apply the law. These matters will be better addressed and handled once we have established the protocols under a single unit to be able to deal with them. So Mr. Speaker, I want to give all honorable members the assurance that this will not go without being action and that we are now and we are going to be in a position when we get through I will speak to my senior minister the honorable member for St. James Central um, so that we can settle on the SPS measures and get the bill before this chamber so uh, Mr. Speaker, that being said, uh, I beg to move that you now. I beg to move that the bill be read a second time. The question is that this bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor of PCI. All those against PCI, no. We take the eyes of it. Was it nice? Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this house be now. I know leave the chair. That you now leave the chair and this house resolves itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. The question is that the speaker do not leave the chair and the house resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the yes have it. House is now in committee. Clause one. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that star uh, clause one stand part. Second. The question is that clause one stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Honorable members against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Clause two. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that clause two stand part. The question is that clause two stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All honorable members against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause three. Mr. Chairman, I do beg to move. I beg to move that clause three to stand part. The question is, the clause three stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Honorable members against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Clause four. I beg to move that clause four to stand part. Beg second. The question is that clause four stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Honorable members against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Schedule. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that the schedule be the schedule to the bill. Second. The question is that the schedule be the schedule to the bill. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All members against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Report. Mr. Chairman, I beg that you do now report to his honor, the, the speaker, the passing of one bill in committee. Second. The question is that I do not report to his honor, the speaker, the passing of one bill in committee. All members in favor, please say aye. All, all those against, please say nay. Thinks the ayes have it. The chairman of committees is reporting the passing of one bill in committee. All members saying. Philip so. Mr. Spe Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be now read a third time. Second. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill do now pass and be cited as the Animals, Disease, and Importation Amendment Bill 2022. Uh, 
Act 2022. Second. The question is that the aforementioned bill be passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This bill is passed and so cited. Honorary Leader of Government. Honorary Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move the adjournment of the House until Tuesday. Honorary Member, Honorary Member, Leader of Government, Ms. Wilder. This okay. needs to be our, our, our recommitment. Recommitment of minutes, sorry. Middle of minutes. Uh, I wish to inform the Honorable Chamber that the minutes of the 19th and 26th of April that were earlier confirmed or inadvertently done so. That is because the said minutes were previously confirmed on the 17th of May 2022. Minutes of the meeting held on Tuesday, the 17th of May, 2022, to be confirmed. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the aforesaid minutes be confirmed. The question is that the aforesaid minutes be confirmed. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. The aforesaid minutes are hereby confirmed. Honorable Leader, government business. Anything else? Are you sure? <laughs> Thank you. I therefore beg to move the adjournment of the House until Tuesday, the 14th of June at 10 a.m. The question is that this honorable chamber be adjourned until the until Tuesday, the 14th day of June at 10 a.m. in the forenoon. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. This honorable chamber stands adjourned until Tuesday, the 14th day of June, 2022 at 10 a.m. in the forenoon.